President Paul Bia and the French ambassador to Cameroon, Christophe Guillou, have been reviewing relations between their two countries and an audience granted the French diplomat at the Unity Palace today. The February session of the routine cabinet meeting holds in Yaoundé today with focus on how to stem the ugly phase of violence in school milieu that has been taking a rather brutal form of late. Cameroon takes a reassuring step towards qualifying for the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo, Japan, overcoming their Zambian hurdles in Yaoundé this afternoon, three goals to two. Those are top stories. Hello, thanks for joining us on the 7.30 News. I am Ben Menopufong. President Paul Beer and the French ambassador to Cameroon, Christophe Guillou, today held talks at the Unity Palace against the backdrop of, recent, of the recent row between Yaoundé and Paris over the pronouncements of the French president on recent happenings in Cameroon. The Unity Palace audience afforded President Beer and his guests the opportunity to review the state of relations between the two countries with a view of easing out the tension provoked by the verbal excesses of the French leader. Ashu Niente, Unity Palace correspondent, now reports. Paris is 6,000 kilometers away from Yaoundé, but the two countries necessarily have a psychological proximity. It is in this context that French Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary Christophe Guillou comes calling on the head of state. He is received as he alights from his car by the Chief of State Protocol before meeting a little the minister, director of the civil cabinet, Samuel Mvondo Ayolo, who shows him to the presidential office before a president looking radiant and sure of himself. Lance Christophe Guilly, ambassador de France. Monsieur ambassador, for about an hour, President Paul B and his guest go over the details of the well-conducted twin municipal and national assembly elections before the president briefs his guest on the commission of inquiry he had created to pop the Ngabo incident, a position which the French share. Uh, was around the situation in the Nozo region and including the, the events that took place in Garbo. Also, the many of the discussion are preparation towards the next Africa France summit due in Bordeaux in June. Paul Bian, the representative of President Emmanuel Macron, notes that relations between both countries couldn't have been better. We have our relations, our bilateral relations, are very old, very rich, uh, very substantive. Whenever we have a difference, we talk to each other. Eye to eye. Christophe Guillou departs from the Inti Palace with the note that the sun is rising in relations between France and Cameroon. The Djangute government met in cabinet today in its traditional monthly come together with the worrying issue of violence in school milieu standing tall on the agenda after presentations from the respective ministers in charge of the educational portfolio the cabinet resolved that measures be implemented speedily to stem the ugly phenomenon f uh, from surging in schools in cameroon as sisako tamko reports the issue had become of such a magnitude that it warranted the entire cabinet to address it Gruesome acts perpetrated in recent times in the school milieu took more than the usual hours allocated for cabinet meetings as members of government did deep diagnosis of the roots of violence and came up with workable and practical solutions, be it at higher secondary or basic education. These acts of violence find their root in the societal systems. Frustrations, dysfunctional families, peer influence, the TV phenomenon with violence being perpetrated in movies and the new being the norm. There has been considerable decline in violence in higher education in recent times due to the intense sensitization campaign according to higher education boss. In the basic education where psychological and physical violence is this government has taken note of certain aspects. All, all our schools are overcrowded except some schools uh, through the rural area and uh, we think that uh, the proximity between 
those who are violent and uh, those who are not is very narrow so that uh, th there is a kind of contamination. Secondly, we have uh, all the new technologies which spray violence everywhere. Our children are very, very young. They start on uh, their TV set, their telephone, and they see everything done there and try to multiply it out. In the second education, the arena of violence with the case of the stabbing of a teacher at the Lycée de Colbison, fresh in one's memory, besides redefining social and religious roles, physical structures may be the short-term solutions. Secure the schools physically, and that is to say to build fences, to use technology, and in this case we're talking about uh, um, we're talking about uh, scanning, scanning children so that we can take off the material metallic weapons that they bring, they bring to school. So uh, we're doing all of that. We're also uh, going to do, as the Prime Minister has instructed, going to use, um, uh, you know, what is it called now? Um, uh, surveillance cameras. The ministers of education were instructed by the head of government to ensure the physical security of schools and universities, search and video surveillance system. Justice Minister on his part will draw a practical guide on the criminal qualification for each type of violence in schools, while basic secondary and women's empowerment are to organize awareness raising campaigns among parent teachers associations. And following the unprecedented acts of violence in the school milieu in Cameroon, school administrators are now employing different strategies to minimize the recurrence of the ugly phenomenon in their schools. Some schools in Yaoundé, for example, have gone as far as intensifying the use of guidance counselors to school the children on the dangers of being violent, not only in school, but in the community as a whole. Gerard Nanji went investigating how the different schools are implementing the measures to curb violence on campuses and brought back the story. There has been a growing wave of violence in schools with the deadly scenario at government technical high school called Bison, still very fresh in the minds of many. It is against this spira of violence that most schools have been taking measures to advert its reoccurrence. We have a, a counselor who used to, to pass in class and speak and change and share with students about violence. When they are coming in, we set their bags and we define what will be the content in every bag. For example, this is something that was found in a student's bag. This can be an element to harm. The consumption of illicit drugs has been attributed to this, and as such, students are continually being sensitized on its impact on their education. Violence in itself is activated by the drugs they take. There are many times that we have seen in, in bags of students knives. You can also see forks. Failure to adhere to these laid down measures only attract sanctions. Those who go contrary of uh, the, the measure we, we, we put in place, discipline council can result uh, dismissing. Uh, so uh, the more violence students are dismissed. And we sometimes always, we, we sometimes bring, uh, bring orders to the gendarmerie. All these measures, school authorities say, is geared towards keeping the devastating effects of violence in our schools. History has been made in Yaoundé as Gilbert Chimievuna, the emblematic government delegate to Yaoundé who wielded power over the capital city for 15 long years, has at last handed over the keys of the capital city to his political successor, Luke Messi Atangana. The new Yaoundé city mayor has the responsibility of implementing the recently promulgated General Decentralization Code, creating a press in Cameroon's local governance. Moki Edwin Kinzaka reports. The signing of these documents indicates an act in which he who has been or was considered as an Iroko tree in the capital city is moved. Jiben Timevuna was deputy government delegate to the Yaoundé City Council from 1987 to 2005 when the keys to the city were officially handed to him, a position he occupied 
up till this March 5, 2020. The Oyama Bang boy metamorphosed Yaoundé from the I saw it was to a city to be. Je salue le travail abattu par he says he will continue in the footsteps of Jeben Chimevuna and that discipline must come back to the city. That is the shoe Messi Atangana Luke has to fit himself into. Little wonder, expectations are high. He should be a transformer and follow exactly the footsteps of his predecessor. I think uh, he's going to come in with some new ingredients for us to transform more the city capital Yaoundé. Cameroon is experiencing an unprecedented push to its decentralization process, a sine qua non to modern development. All municipalities, the decentralization code states, are party to it in the new dispensation. In like manner, the senior staff of the Douala City Council have been urged to work in collaboration with the new team that is taking over the helm of the city to, and, and this was during a handing over ceremony that saw the former government delegate Fritz Ntonentone handing over the keys of the city to his political successor, uh, uh, Victor Basa Dine. We have details in this report with Skola Maloke from Douala. The entry of Dr. Fritz Tonentone and the city mayor elect for Douala, Roger Victor Mbassandini, into the conference room of the Douala City Council was greeted by the personnel. Addressing the personnel, Dr. Fritz Tonentone, in a relaxed mood, told them not to be sad for a new era is about starting within the institute. While presenting his deputies to the mayor elect, Dr. Fritz Tonentone said they started seven of them in 2006 but only four are left as some were snatched by death. Before leaving the podium, Dr. Frint Tonentone took the engagement to work with the city mayor-elect, Roger Victor Mbassadine, in any possible way. On his part, the city mayor-elect not only thanked his predecessor for the initiative, but congratulated him for all the projects realized in the city of Douala within the past 14 years. Roger Victor Mbassadine informed the personnel that he is someone who is result-oriented and thus will want them to put their all to make the city of Douala an enviable one. To achieve this, he said he will use his contacts to source for finances with which to improve, especially the road network in the city. All eyes and ears are now focused on tomorrow, Friday, March 6th, when the technical handing over will take place in the presence of the senior divisional officer for the Vuri. A presidential decree of the 2nd of March 2020 has created the National School of Local Administration whose main mission is to train candidates in specialized domains of local administration. Under the supervisory of health authority of the Ministry of the Decentralization and Local Government, the aim is to ensure that those charged with enforcing local development are equipped with the necessary tools. Clarice Arue Takang explains how. The administration of councils, regions, and other decentralized territorial collectivities, as well as the establishments, trade unions, and groups. This is the scope embraced by the National School of Local Administration, NASLA, headquartered in Boya, Southwest Region. The presidential decree of March 2, 2020, has seen the portfolio of the Training Center for Municipal Administration henceforth handed over to the newly created public professional and administrative institution. The main mission of NASLA will be to ensure the professional training of candidates in domains and fields related to local administration. There are four stages to choose from, in line with specific needs or competence to be developed, useful for decentralized territorial collectivities in order to attain the objectives. The National School of Local Administration, under the supervisory authority of the Ministry of Decentralization and Local Development, will be administered by Board of Directors and the Director General. Senior officials, as well as specialized agents and civil servants involved in local administration are amongst those targeted for training. Special sessions may equally be organized by the school to build the capacities of personnel for various reasons. 
depending on the nature of training, between six months and two years will be required for students who can access either through competitive exams or other selection process. The creation of the National School of Local Administration comes at a time when efforts to fast-track effective decentralization have intensified nationwide. Construction work has resumed on the Sangmelima Bikul, Bikula Jum Road in the south region of the country after over a year of interruption. Public Works Minister Emmanuel Ngannou Jumesi, who is currently on an evaluation mission at the project site, saluted the resumption of work, which has been effective since January 2020. He used the opportunity to announce that measures have been taken to clear every obstacle that had been impeding the progress of the project. Joyce Kibifawaju is with the minister in June. A dusty image that will soon be classified as bulldozers and trucks have resumed on full gear on the Sangmalima Bikola Road construction site. Excavators are busy emptying swampy portions like here in Dom. But this engagement is challenged by fish ponds and farms present on the road construction site as a result of inappropriation. Like here in Kos, the difficulties are several. The main problems are the uh, expropriation and the, uh, to pay the indemnity for the peoples and the uh, retard of payment. Over seven stops at critical portions of the road to give instructions on how to accelerate work, the Minister of Public Works, Emmanuel Nganun Jumesi, halted by this pygmy settlement that have presented the continuation of work on that portion of the road. They have their bargain. <laughs> Concerns taken care of as the minister promised an immediate action by government and the payment of bills to construction company. After the 103 kilometers long visit on the Sangmalima Jom portion of the road, the visit continued to Mintom Lele and Lele Ntam Balam Road on the construction. All these with the endeavor to review a speedy completion work schedule for regional road. And you're watching the 7.30 News on the Cameroon Radio Television, the CRTV. We are beaming live from Yaoundé. Political analysts continue to affirm that non-governmental organizations that rely on funding from all kinds of donors have the tendency to be influenced in one way or the other by donor organizations and by yielding to the pressure from the donors it enables them to obtain such advantages and privileges as tax exemptions and others. In today's edition of our running series on NGOs, Cynthia Saptala looks at the financial and or political benefits that those promoting NGOs stand to gain. Not all sources of funding to NGOs are untrustworthy. A majority rely on different and transparent funding models, while some accept donors of all categories. Donors, experts say, come with personal interest. Funding is a serious problem because these associations, they face difficulties to have funding to be able to perform their goals so they are easily lured into getting into partnership with this fraudulent NGO. Since non-profit organizations operate differently from profit businesses, these providers or promoters find other ways of gaining from their charitable gestures. These promoters gain by having easy access to international journeys, tax exemptions, or using these NGOs to find good universities for their children or job opportunities as consultants. Those who do finance NGOs and the objective they intend to attain when they do diffuse some particular messages or images to the rest of the world, most especially to pull international opinion and maybe draw pressure from different angles towards a particular regime in place. Some experts add that the real interest of some of these donors may be evident and it is up to the organization to focus on its humanitarian objective. 
Civitas Cameroon, who've been contacted by some foreign bodies to be able to finance us through money laundry so that we can carry out certain activities that are not in line with the principles and perspectives of Civitas Cameroon on promotion of human rights and protection of the environment with our flagship program being Empower a Woman. Legal experts also state that there are provisions in the law that handle such actions. Section 304 says that whoever makes to any person in authority, whether public or private, a false report liable to prosecution or to disciplinary measures shall be punished with imprisonment for six months to five years. The Cameroonian Defence Force has come to be known as the People's Friendly Army over the years because it puts the population at the centre of its action in times of war like in time of peace. That's how our series on the Army as a People's Friendly Force uh, zooms tonight on the operational military health services where the synergy between the Army and the nation comes to play. Kilian Dantifon is our man on the beat. In Bisonga Bank, Sham and Manfe in Manu Division, like in Ezabato, Indian or in Fundong Divisions, and other areas in the country, the Operational Health Division of the Army places the population first at the risks of its elements. In front line, we have to save people because you know that there are a lot of people who are losing their life just for hemorrhage. We have to stop it and to be medical doctor, military doctor, the only thing you want is to save Cameroonian, even civilian and military. Even opponents. Apart from rehabilitation of hospitals, donation of medical kits, treatment and other health needs, they take care of the vulnerable. When they are troubled, Disabled, what are they going to do? Old people, what are they doing? Mad people, what are they doing? Is our role to take care of them. They also assure health coverage of events like the upcoming International Women's Day. With the Cameroonian Defense Forces, the army at the service of the nation is not a slogan. It is practical on the field. It is an everyday experience. In our Thursday in the regions, we take you to the North region where women in that part of the country have been receiving training from some vocational training centers in order to become economically independent. There are victims of abuse and school dropouts who are being given tools to start their lives all over again. Wilson Mengole has been watching how that has been playing out in that part of the country and now reports from Garwa. Professional institutions in the North region, like Sar Esim, Inyet, Women Empowerment Centers, are avenues to solve the equation of training, employment, and job creation. Formations like many opportunities like accounting, marketing, finance. Are the Women Empowerment Centers described by many as homes of professional excellence? Trainees from different backgrounds are armed with knowledge for job creation. Nous avons des filles qui ont été victimes de mariage précoce. We have victims of early and forced marriages in our centers. We equally have victims of inheritance problems. We receive these girls who can't recite the alphabet, especially those who have not gone to school and even drop out. We train girls on clothing, computing, and hotel management. Generally, girls that come to the Women Empowerment Centers benefit from other trainings. The kind of training offered in these centers is adapted to the region's climate and environmental demands. And there are many who attest that a good number of the products of these vocational training centers are worthy ambassadors excelling as employees in private and public sectors in the country. 
While the women in the north are struggling to get themselves reintegrated into normal routine life, their counterparts in the east have already given up on the hope of wearing a new fabric for Women's Day come March 8th this year. On the contrary, they are now interested in the activities that they will be leading on March 8th so as to prove their might as the women who make the society. Our reporter Mokom Robert Achu took interest in some of the activities that the women of the east region will be showing to the public come March 8. A good number of activities have been taking place in different points and structures in Betwa and the East Region as a whole ahead of this year's Women's Day on the 8th of March. Most of these activities are beneficial to the women as they either learn a lot from them or are sensitized on many aspects that are beneficial to the population at large. Roundtable conferences, musical concerts, sales expositions are just a few of such activities. The female staff of the East Regional Delegation of Public Health has organized one of such activities ahead of the Women's Day. It is a free consultation of women and children. During this free consultation exercise, the staff are advising women to always take their children to hospitals and also advise their husbands that the best place to go for consultation and treatment is the hospital and not to which doctors. On their part, the East Regional Delegation of Women's Empowerment and the Family decided to identify some needy women to offer them gifts of food items and other basic necessities. The regional delegation of women's empowerment and the family have decided to celebrate with the needy and the internal displaced person. Those are the person who have moved from their own region to the east region because of this uh, anglophone crisis or because of Boko Haram. More of such preparative activities ahead of the Women's Day are continuously taking place to either sensitize the women on one aspect or the other or offer them one thing or the other ahead of the commemoration of the day on the 8th of March. And the women of the Cameroon Radio Television have equally been on the front line, multiplying one action to the other to the build-up to their celebrations come March 8. Today, they were on the football pitch at the Nguakele Military Stadium for a football in friendly against the counterparts of the Hydrocarbon Prizes Stabilization Fund, a game which ended 3-1 in favor of the women of the Hydrocarbon Prize Stabilization Fund. Prior to that event, they were at a cosmetic shop downtown Yaoundé for some beauty tips. Yoti Kale Lisonge has a roundup of the CRTV Women's Day and, and activities in Yaoundé today. To these CRTV women, looking good is good business. So to keep up with their looks, they're enlightened on some beauty tips. Here, the secret to prevent them from aging is also disclosed, but it remains for their ears only. A spray to brighten their looks, and off the go to the Nguaykele military stadium for a football friendly with the ladies of the Hydrocarbon Prizes Stabilization Fund, CSPH. On the pitch, a determined CRTV team confronts a dominant CSPH site. We opened the scores after five minutes of play. Fifteen minutes into the game, tired legs struggle to keep up. Another attempt on goal ends with a brilliant save from CRTV's keeper. But not even that could save the team with a porous defense from conceding again at the 19th minute. Shortly after, it's half time. The score is 2 0, and the ladies get a pep talk before kickoff. A few seconds into the second half, the referee blows in favor of the CRTV team. The result a free kick which sends the ball hard into the goal. At this time, fresh legs are introduced and the playing style modified. After several attempts, CSPR thrives and crowns the friendly with a third goal. At the end of the day, it's all about having fun and celebrating. <laughs> 100 women in Ubala trained in the Information and Communication Technologies by the African Institute of Computer, the IAI, uh, have received their end-of-course attestations. The training is part of the MIGEV 2035 vision and falls within the framework of this year's International Women's Day activities. Gilbert Ongene was in Ubala. On the end of a two-week training for these women of Obala in the Lekia division of the central region. Obala is a rural area for the president of the republic. It is very important to do that uh, children, uh, youth and women can train in ICT. 
thanks to funding from the group Minta, headed by Erencien Fono, matron of this badge of trainees, the women today master the theoretical and practical aspects of the computer. The women trained in Word and Excel have been exhorted to put the knowledge acquired to good use so as to improve on their output in their various areas of competence. Many of such trainings in favor of women and youths by EIE are said to be in the pipeline. Let's talk sports now. The indomitable lionesses of Cameroon has have taken a very great option today for the 2020 Olympic Games in Tokyo, Japan, by beating their Zambian counterparts three goals to two in the first leg confrontation of their last round of the qualifying games for that Olympic for the Olympic Games. The encounter took place at the Yaoundé Omi Sports Stadium, and our reporter Romeo Kenya watched that match and is here with highlights. Both selections came with the ambition of emerging winners, but the Lionesses proved stronger at home after a tough cracker. The first segment was simply that of the Copper Queens, as they used their youthful exuberance to impose audacity by opening score. One goal down, the Lionesses did not hesitate to reply thanks to a beautiful strike from Joya Ajara in a one-to-one -one combination. During the second half, both teams came with vitality and rigor, improving play styles. After crashing out on several occasions to increase tally, Abudi Ongene finally gave her response at the 71st minute. But that didn't last, as Captain Barbara Banda and Grace Chanda maximized defense quagmires to equalize. It is later on at stoppage time that Abuti Ongene once again match up experience with talent to net a breeze that permitted Cameroon to impose authority. Inside Zambia's defense, What an opportunity! Go! Go! After a five-goal thriller in Yaoundé this Thursday, the reverse fixture is later for Tuesday in Lusaka, Zambia. The Lionesses will need just a draw there to grab their ticket for the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games. Now I want to account down on to, to the 2020 African Champions Na African Nations Championship that Cameroon will be hosting come April this year to take you to Douala where the renovated reunification stadium is one of the uh, earmarked venues to host matches of that competition. Um, uh, the 40,000 capacity stadium that will host Group C of the competition has received a major facelift as Jules Dema now tells us from CRTV Littoral. The Bepanda Omnisport Stadium is one of the major infrastructures earmarked for the AFCON 2021. Few months to the event, works are ongoing and improving reasonably. We visited this morning, the observation is clear. The green turf is ready. The multiple post grounds waiting for athletes. The lighting and sound system for both the main stadium and training ground have completely been installed. It is an amazing and impressive renovated Bepanda Omnisport Stadium. The Canadian company Magil Construction reassures that they are up to the task and ready to meet with the needs and requirements of the government. The 40,000 capacity Bepanda Stadium is gaining form up to international standards. The presidential tribune and other seats have also been mounted. The dressing room the reporting boxes, the parking, the training grounds, nothing has been left out. Impossible then to slow down the machine put in place ahead of this important football jamboree. No room for rumors or negative inputs. Cameroon in general and Douala in particular is moving straight to organizing one of the best continental sports events ever. 
And that's it for tonight and for the week. I'll be back on Monday. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye. CRTV News, ici, toute l'info.